Is it possible to beat Baldur's Gate as a lone wolf tactician as a... A uh, bard, barbarian, cleric, druid, rogue, ranger, sir... Okay, you get the point. We're playing as all the classes. A couple ground rules going in, of course, is I'll be limiting my companion involvement as much as possible. There's an achievement to multi-class as every class without going to withers, so respecking won't be allowed either. I'll be limiting my use of summons, no saves coming, and every time I level up, I leave it up to fate. The wheel shall dictate our fate. And without further ado, let's see what we're starting as. Alright, level 1 druid. It's not the best start, however, it certainly could have been worse. Now if you haven't realized already, there's going to be a large problem with this run. Most classes get their defining features and abilities at level 2 or 3. For instance, as a druid, our ability to wild shape at level 2, and as a fighter, our subclass at level 3. Now throw all of that into the garbage, since we'll only be getting classes level 1 bonuses. This means some classes are way better than others. Barbarian getting rage, for instance, and sorcerers getting their whole subclass. I'll explain what each class gives us as I class into them, but for now just know as a druid we have nothing except for being a wisdom-based spellcaster. For race, I'll pick human, just because the more versatile we are, the weaker we'll be. Our stats are going to be important to get right now, since we'll never be able to change them. In the end, I decided for something like this. There are ways to increase your strength, dexterity, constitution, and intelligence with items, so they aren't too important to maximize. However, we don't want to be useless early on, so we'll put enough into dex to get plus two to our armor class, maximize our wisdom, and try to balance everything else. I honestly should have put more into Charisma, but whatever. What's the point in min-maxing a build that's abysmal and everything? Jack of all trades, master of none. Not for a name. Hmm. Oh, I know. The good old Nautiloid. I've only done this about a million times already. Regardless, we find ourselves in a strange place aboard a strange ship, and I want to go home. To do this, I need to rush to the bridge. And our first of many allies, Lazel, appears. She's a proud Githyanki warrior, a race dedicated to fighting the Mind Flayers, like the ship we're on. We won't be seeing much of her. Don't forget, this is a lone wolf. We take her life and her armor, because it gives us 16 armor class, which is the most we can have at this stage of the game. Well, you'll see her for a while longer. Using the store also resurrects your party. Oops. Well, at least now she can be introduced to our second ally, Shadowheart. Don't grow too fond, she's suicidal. Lazel is having an unlucky day and dies for the second time, getting caught in the blast. Oh well, I guess I'll do the battle on my own. And by battle, I mean running away. These guys hardly give any XP, and I don't feel like trying to cheese Zulk for an hour. We'll be getting better weapons soon anyhow. We crash land on a strange beach and have one goal in mind. To get rid of this damn brain worm. Oh, hey Shadowheart. Funny seeing you here. Is that a Rubik's Cube? I'll take it. I've actually never sold one though, so I guess I got all run to figure that out. The next couple of groups of enemies are weak but jam-packed with XP and we're already spinning the Wheel of Destiny again. Ooh, Ranger is fairly decent to get early on. They provide a large and diverse set of abilities at level 1. They're still not the best, ranging from mediocre to bad. But we'll be able to take Beast Tamer to use the spell Find Familiar to make a variety of allies. All are very weak, don't get me wrong, but they're more combat ready than Mage Hand. I'll also be taking Ranger Knight, since our strengths won't be coming from our weapons, but rather our items. And I'll be wanting that proficiency with heavy armor. There are several very nice pieces of heavy armor, one per act at the very least, so we'll be able to retain some level of tankiness to ourselves. No soon after that, we're thrown into our first proper combat. Our enemies, some wargs, goblins, and our own hubris. Our allies, bird. Everyone else is irrelevant. Don't forget all of our summons suck. Hey, thanks Will. I'll pay you back later. This fight will be a great first example of why we need to play it safe. And we unfortunately went a bit gung-ho here, and I'm desperately in need of healing. Fortunately for me, I'm the protagonist who can dodge every hit. Now, unfortunately, it seems everyone else is the protagonist today since no one can hit anything. Like, what in the world is going on here? This isn't spliced around for a joke or anything, these are back-to-back -back rolls. Okay, good. This is an unneeded amount of stress for a simple goblin encounter. Battered and bloodied, we take a long rest, but not just any long rest, a partial long rest. 
since we'll be resting a lot, I'll be doing this to retain my provisions, though I will be doing proper long rests as needed. So, Will, you helped us at the gate, so we better thank you for making this run a little less lone wolf. But anyways, welcome to the Emerald Grove, home of the druids and tiefling refugees. There's a variety of factors at play, sides to choose. In my case, let's just side with the tieflings. Believe it or not, I've done this the least in my playthroughs, so they deserve a break. To do this, we can either fight the druids or the goblins. I'll have to fight the goblins, if not only for the fact that I am also a druid. Here's Volothamp, proud D&D author and antiquarian. We'll be seeing him later since I also hear he's a practicing surgeon. Other characters we care about here include Auntie Ethel. She can create some very nice elixirs including Hill Giant Strength. She sells three of these every day, so every time I long rest I'll be making sure to stop by and buy her entire stock. We barely take out some more goblins, utilizing the surrounding defenses to ensure our victory. Down the road we encounter an abandoned village, and wary of an ambush, we head through the side entrance and convince the locals of my absolute strength, getting us to level 3! Bring it on, wheel! Damn, I really wanted Sorcerer. Rogue is pretty good though. We get a situational d6 to our damage, as well as some extra proficiencies with our expertise. I'll be putting them into sleight of hand and persuasion since I feel like we're going to be doing a lot of that. With each level we grow ever stronger. Though if I were to measure it I would say 1% stronger. The best thing I can say is we got more HP, which works for me. To get true strength, let's stop by Auntie in the swamp again. I completely zone out everything she's saying and buy a whole new supply of hell giant strength. Since it's been a day since we last talked, she's got a fresh stock. This is why I didn't want to put too many points into strength, since we're going to be having 21 for the rest of the round, essentially. However, I did not want to play the beginning with only 8 strength. We have plenty of stats to spare anyways, though. I might have put all those points into sleight of hand, but that doesn't mean I have to pick things. A good smack or two will just about open anything. Right at the warp in the village is a chest with a haste helm, which will be pretty good to help us position at the start of combat. Mobility will be key in this run. Making our way down the road, we encounter a burning building, and naturally we fail to save anybody. Get this thing off me! We decided to bust down the door the good old fashioned way, and uh, excuse me guys, got people to save, thank you. And by people I mean smoked beets. Extra smoked at this rate. If you didn't know, on Tactician, Rusting uses 80 provisions, so I'm gathering all that I can this act. There's some more smoked meat in this building, beside the main house. And for our thoroughness, we're granted a pretty good bow. Better than one I had, at least. Let's put it to good use by killing the local demon. Karlak, our hot-headed companion, has been causing quite a ruckus, and we've got to put an end to it. Our good friends, the Paladin of Tear, offered me a cool sword to do her in. So I'd probably do it anyways. We'll start off by pickpocking our potions in. Ah, oh, for the love of. It's fine, we can salvage it. Yeah, okay, screw it. Remembering that point I made about being cautious, I burned my level 1 spells to burst her down with some ice knives, and that's all the companions did. Except for Gale. I wonder what he's up to. We hand the Devil's Head over to the Paladins of Tear and get the SOJ. It has good damage and gives us a plus 2 AC spell, which is pretty handy. I don't prefer either two or one-handed weapons. Ultimately, two-handed is better DPS, but we won't be getting a feat this time around since we'll never be level four, and that means no great weapon master or anything good. After getting steamrolled by a massive boulder, doing a whopping six damage, I make my way up into the Null Cave and find someone in need. We rescue them and take them to safety before the Nulls can get to them. Once again, the day has been saved thanks to me. Just some good old jack shit. Beside the Emerald Grove is a ruin full of looters who have very bad awareness, taking two of them out in one move. Let's do a conveniently placed stone block. Problem is this damn mage. She knows sleep and ice knife, so she has perfect 1-2 combo to kill me at any time. After getting slept an embarrassing amount of times, I stop playing like an idiot and bait her where she can't hit me. Ah, it feels nice to have a high survival proficiency. I can actually dig up dig spots around the map. They tend to have potions and scrolls we can use, or at the very least, money. 
Not over yet, though. Still one more on the inside, which we dispatch as easily. And did I say one? I meant five. I hate this combat. We get large spikes in power later on as we get access to rare or even legendary items. So for now, we're reliant on our wit. It do happen to be planted right next to an oil barrel, so that's a thing. Another thing we have going for us? Crab. We park them beside the door, ready for an ambush. They kind of moved away from my oil barrel. That wasn't our only trick. We'll coat the entire area with fire anyways to get some ticking damage while they trickle in. Our crab has been eagerly awaiting his time to shine, and he delivers. His pinchers cleave through our foes, and while they're taken aback by his might, I shut the door behind them. Taking the time to do some dipping, lighting our Sword of Justice ablaze. The enemies are now in a panic, with their friends desperately breaking the door down to try and save them. It's too late, however. Cornered, the enemies stand no chance and fall quickly. The remaining foes finally manage to break down the door, and to their dismay, their friends are already dead. Grief-stricken, they take out my crab. Grief-stricken, I take their lives. In the back chamber lie some undead in defense of a long-forgotten tomb. I hold myself up in the burial chamber and defend the oncoming onslaught. Fortunately, they can't hit me with this chest here, so they must break their way through. Seeing no better option, they try to find another way in to no avail. From here, it's easy pickings. Now to speak to someone even more useless than I am. Withers! He allows us to respec, resurrect allies, or purchase companions. Guess which of these we'll be doing? None of them! It's alright, if I want anyone to be in my camp, it's useless people. Like Volo! Speaking of, let's go see how he's doing. Last I heard, he was going to the goblin camp for some research. Well, it looks like he's been captured. Typical Volo things. I'll have to save him later. We get some decent boots from the goblin trader, and make our way into the camp. Thanks to our brain wriggler, we can demand entry and work on our first boss of the run. The goblin bosses. Being Gut, Dror Raglan, and Benthara. Before I deal with any of them, I stealth my way to the side room here, which contains Barrelmancy. Shorthand for blowing up everything with explosives. I probably won't need to do it this run, and it's essentially an unofficial rule, but it's typically a last resort option. We brand ourselves to earn the trust of Gut. Who has a solution for our brain wriggler? She demands I leave the rest of our party behind and come for a one-on-one. -on -one. Way ahead of you. We don't have the best spell in the game yet, but there's another way to garner enemies' attentions. If you move an object that's not yours, enemies will be upset and go to pick it up. So, in a process I like to call dirtbag transportation, we move an object, like a box, they go to pick it up, and we move it again, and again, until we're able to pick up the Whittle Goblin Priestess and toss her in the convenient chasm. She did have the key to this back room, but for this stage in the game, we are quite proficient. Rolling a 3, we get a 13 with our modifiers. We'll be coming back here soon after taking out the remaining goblin leaders, but next up on our hit list is Minthara. Before doing anything in the goblin camp, I recommend you destroy the war drums, as goblins can call reinforcements if they're allowed to reach them. Now there isn't a good high ground position to reach Minthara, but if you watch my fire only video, you might see where this is going. With some careful box stacking, we can create an outcropping to shoot Minthara from. I love the strategy too much to not do it again. Form a frog, go! He didn't last long. The goblin beside Minthara immediately bucks it for the war drum and is devastated to see it smashed. Minthara herself uses soul branding, making her hit even harder. And then hold persons me. Welcome to the recurring theme this run. After breaking free, Minthara makes it oh so tempting to break the bridge to knock her in. But I want her loot, namely her parasite. Though it makes me wish I hadn't. You'll notice as to why I refuse to fight her in a straight one on one. She's a paladin with like 15 oath charges and can lay on hands every turn to negate all my damage. Nothing to do but to burn through them all. Any day now. Preferably today. She eventually runs out, which took so long I didn't even realize my bow wasn't on fire anymore. 
If you didn't know already, you can dip your weapons in fire, including candles, which is why I keep a ribcage full of them in my backpack. We aren't invincible up here. Manthara can still throw a spear when she wants to, but from here it's pretty straightforward. The goblin falls and Manthara goes after 15 more volleys. There's an illithid parasite in that corpse. Now before we take on Dror Raglan, I suppose we've got to rescue his biggest fan. Race you there. Well, let's see what happens. Yep, that's about what I expected. Luckily, we're not stuck. We can talk to Volo and convince the guard to let us out. I call upon my illithid powers since I don't want to be in here forever. Life for you, Volo. I'll catch you later. We're nearing level 4. There's plenty of bosses around, but I want to be a high level before I go gallivanting in. It's painful killing these spiders, but it has to be done. The pain is too deep though, and we need a flea to better prepare. Our camp is looking more complete though, with the best dog in the realms and the best surgeon, who says he has a totally certified treatment option available. Bolo. Bolo. Bolo, please. Well, despite the hell we just endured, the flesh is weak and Volo supplements us with a mechanical eyeball, one that lets us see invisible creatures. After that ordeal, I don't even want to fight spiders right now. Is there anything easier? You know what, some hyenas can't be too bad. We can kill them from afar with our sneak attack. Mmm, you know what, that doesn't seem good. Oh goodness gracious, that's a lot of them. Where's a barrel when I need it? Luckily it's two different groups of enemies, so we can take them out individually. Now the problem are these gnolls. Who can move a bajillion meters around? Do they really need an extra 18 meters of movement speed? Well, surprisingly, we're still maneuverable with 30 meters. This is since we have the Boots of Speed, which is like a bonus action dash. I got this as part of my earlier grinding, but that's a whole new area, so I'll save it for later to keep this video organized. Act 1 is a large area comprising of two more regions called the Mountain Pass and the Underdark, which we will also be tackling. Well, the fight is a grind, but nothing too problematic arises. We get level 4 and finish off all the gnolls. They can't hurt us since, if we're out of range, they'll sudden rush towards us where we can shoot and subsequently run away. With all the gnolls dealt with, it's time to level up again. And spin that wheel. Now is as good a time as any to mention I stream on Twitch if you want to catch any of my antics live. Link in the description. Hey, who's that? We got our first S tier class of the run, Sorcerer. Sorcerers get their subclass at level 1, so we get a big boost in power. Draconic Ancestry would only get us a whopping 1 HP, so that's out of the question. I feel like Storm Sorcery is the best option, adding considerably to our evasiveness. Though, Wild Magic is much more fun, making a random effect happen ever so often when we cast our spells. We also get access to some very powerful cantrips and spells. Firebolt is a solid damage option for us now, Mage Hand will help us with our versatility, Friends helping us in skill checks, and Minor Illusion helping us in everything else. This is that S tier spell I mentioned earlier when we were fighting Gut. Now we can move enemies wherever we want. Spells I take Magic Missile for some solid guaranteed damage, and Shield as a precaution. Back at the Goblin Camp, now I'm ready to take on Dror Ragslin. I did say I wanted to not use Barrelmancy when possible, but I wanted to showcase Minor Illusion in action. So I'll just use one barrel. From atop our perch, we cast Minor Illusion to attract the attention of all surrounding enemies who are just infatuated with the sight of a cat. I did mess up the positioning with the brazier, but we've got Molotovs we can throw. And nobody knows. Ah crap, they know. We destroyed all the war drums earlier, so no more reinforcements will be coming. Taking out the Warlock is our first priority, since they can cast Old Person and stun me forever. With the Tears Protection and the High Ground, we shouldn't get hit too much. And thank goodness too, because those spears can actually one-shot us. Utilizing gravity, we kill the last member and move on to finish Drawer. Who I completely underestimate. Look at this guy's freaking movement. He runs like 30 meters all the way to the High Ground to shove me to my death. 
Well, we're still fine. We cast our spells from range and continue to click our heels into a full retreat. Not underestimating his movement again, we cut him along the scaffolding, ensuring we're a full diagonal away. Which is just barely enough to keep him at a distance. Despite this though, one last time I didn't respect him enough and he nearly shoved me off once more to my death. However, I cling onto the high ground and we're just barely able to take out the last goblin camp leader. We speak with Zevalor, who gives us a reward and that we turn down. I'm just happy to finally properly help the tieflings for a run. We've done all we want to do in this area for now, so let's head down into the underground. Back at the door by Priestess Gut, we enter sneak our way past the guard, and do some puzzling. The goal is to get all the black circles under the sunlight. Afterwards, an underground passageway appears, leading to the Underdark. Thanks for watching this far. If you're interested in me paying my rent this month, feel free to hit that subscribe button. I recently added channel membership, so if you want me to eat tonight, feel free to join. And lastly, if you're enjoying the video so far, I'm glad. Yep, that's it. I've shielded enough already, so let's get back to the vid. Right away at the gate is a huge minotaur trying to break in. We can let it die normally, however I'm opening the gate to leech that last hit. Easy 75 XP. So to not get blasted like he did, I'm booking it in turn based mode, which is quite easy since we're still rather agile. On the other side is a deep rumbling which we ignore. It's probably nothing. Oh what the hell is that? Go, 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 go. I don't trust these mushrooms, so let's be a bit careful. Ah, safety. Gah! Some even more suspicious looking mushrooms confront us, and we convince them that we mean no harm. Here's where we got the psychic spark from earlier, which gives us a free cast of magic missile. And gives us an extra missile, which makes us extra fortunate we had rolled sorcerer. Other items of note are at Dareth Bonecloak who sells a ring called the Caustic Band, giving us a consistent plus two acid damage to our attacks. She also has a request to rescue her husband, which I'll do now. These mushrooms just keep getting more suspicious, like what am I looking at here? So we carefully maneuver our way to this pack and torch here, since these things are highly, um, explosive. Yep. Any day now. Hello? Like, seriously, who would want to be anywhere near here? It's a good thing I never triggered these mushrooms. <laughs> but that didn't happen. Balin is safe and sound, and we give him the noble stock we picked up as well, curing his mind of his trauma. I don't really have a good reason to do this, but later down the road it might pay off. Since we're helping people, there's a gnome here who's been badly poisoned. Luckily, I know where to find some antitoxin. Back at the Emerald Grove, we're raiding Nettie's room. There's a cauldron of Theriac here, which you can make an unlimited amount of Elixir of Sylvanas with a little Mugwort bundle. It's a wee bit glitched for me it seems this time, but Nettie has one rolling around in her pockets. There's several ways to heal the gnome, but this is easiest for me. We give her an Elixir of Sylvanas and she gives us the Boots of Speed, which are absolutely busted. For a bonus action, it allows us to dash and give enemies disadvantage on opportunity attacks. I love these things, it gives us so much mobility. We'll be immediately utilizing it on Kek, who has the real antidote. But I'd rather kill him after I have the Boots of Speed, rather than before. So, uh, okay, I wanted to minimize Barrelmancy, but come on, it's just too satisfying. I won't use it to 100 to 0 any major bosses. Besides, Gek's still fine, see? Alright, he's dead, whatever. Here's essentially the fight that would have happened without the barrel. Throw, click our heels, and run. But with about 15 more guys, so we didn't miss out on much. We have a much more interesting fight coming up very soon. The dwarves die, and we can progress to the next area, boots intact. We're off to Grimforge. I wonder why it's called that. Well, a book on Flumph mating rituals explains it. Yeah, that's right. It's a magically disguised book. It actually contains information on the Admantine Forge. Oh yes, please. We waste no time and head across the lake on Gek's boat. Welcome to Grim Forge, and I'm speedrunning this one. I need to forge myself a new set of armor and fast. With our heavy armor proficiency, 
This will be one of the better pieces we can wear, so I want it now. We'll need to put on our old shoes here just to barely make this jump. Right where our splint mold is. Here we are at the great Adamantine Forge. And oh, what's that? That's level 5, baby. Wheel time. Alright, fighter isn't the absolute worst thing. It gives us a decent amount of HP, and gives us a way to sustain. I'm real sad I haven't gotten Barbarian yet. Something important fighter does give us is a fighting style, which we'll I'll be putting into defense. Since we can't utilize dual wielding effectively, two-handed to the fullest potential, one-handed with a shield is our best bet. We'll be able to get 21 AC before the act is over. For now though, we've got one major roadblock. The Defender of the Adamantine Forge. A bunch of magma methods. To activate the forge, we need to get a mold, which we've got, and some ore, which is protected. Normally these guys jump out of the magma to ambush us, but we can use our mage hand to start the combat while we hide in safety. From here, it's nothing a couple spears can fix. A reminder for everyone to loot bookcases. They usually contain a good number of scrolls. And, of course, what we came here for, our precious ore. I feel like we could have gotten a lot more out of this vein. No wonder it's such a rare material. Adding both our mold and our ore, we can hit the hammer and begin forging. Now, the book also mentioned we need lava. Where is... Ah, here it is. Ah, who the heck are you? Oh. Oh! Grimforge. Makes sense. Well, believe it or not, he's not too tough, since he's weak to one thing. Boxes! And maybe a massive hammer, but we'll get to that. I put a box in between these gaps here, since the arena will fill with lava, and we want to freely walk over the gaps. And without further ado, let's see how I like to easily beat Grim. Our first turn is a waiting turn. We'll want Grim to position himself on the hammer platform, and if you're perfect with your positioning, you can get him in the lava and on the platform, which I do here. Now give that lever a tug. Some methods will spawn, which you'll additionally need to deal with. If you did it right, Grim will stand back up right under the platform again for round two. Now depending, the lava may or may not still be there. In my case it wasn't, and I'm not entirely sure what decides it. Either way, we'll need to make it work. And that requires turning the lava back on which we accomplish with the speed potion. We'll have to deal with the ensuing enemies, however, both Mephits and Grim. We get absolutely swarmed on all sides and just cling on to our HP. And here's Grim, who's a tiny bit upset. Luckily, he can't punch us thanks to the Mephits surrounding us, but he can still do tons of area damage. So we obviously don't want to be here, and we disengage and flee. We want to end our turn so that we're opposite of Grim. That way, he'll position himself on the platform once more. We can't quite get to the hammer this turn, but we can shoot the lever with our bow to bring down the hammer a third time. Grim is nearly dead at 37 HP, but unfortunately my speed potion is just about to wear out, which will stun me for a turn. To counter this, I use my Shrouded and Shadow to go invisible for two turns to hopefully wait out the stun. I position myself next to the valve just in case I need to release more lava. Grim stands up and is unfortunately not superheated, which means we're going to need to hope for the best. While Grim waits, however, he's helping us take down magma methods, which is a huge help. Grim walks at us one more time, being superheated in the process, where we promptly run away once more to the other side of the arena. I have enough remaining HP to tank the last method, and just barely with one last smack, we can kill the defender of the forge. Oh, and uh, that Grim guy. Can't forget about that one. It's time to unveil this latest piece of armor, Adamantine Splint. Reducing enemies' damage towards us, inflicting reeling, and no more crits. Now we've reached 21 armor class, and I'm feeling good about our strength level. I've cleaned out the Underdark for everything I've wanted, so now, let's head for the Mountain Pass. On the bright side, the mountain pass is one of the shorter areas, so we can get right to it. In these ruins is located a Githyanki crush, containing many powerful Githyanki and artifacts. 
You learn about one of them immediately with a puzzle. To solve it, you need to assemble all four items, one being a mace, a rusty one you can find underneath the stairs, a ceremonial battle axe can be found in this broken wall, oops, and atop the crush you can find a couple eagles, and in the nest is the warhammer. Thanks however to Minor Illusion, we can distract the bird pair and slip in and out without any detection. When placed upon the proper altars, a secret door containing the Dawnmaster's crest appears, which will help us attain a powerful weapon. Deeper in the monastery, we find the crush itself, and doing some smooth talk, we make our way inside and aim to get the blood of Lothander. The Githyanki are very interested in my Rubik's Prism, which I use to convince them to allow me entry. We're in, and in here is quite the welcoming party, which I promptly ignore. So anyways, over here is a couple statues. One of them tends to get stuck, but you should hopefully have a reasonable grease stockpile to lubricate the mechanism. Remember, sun rise in east, set in west. And we're here in our secret little treasure vault. Destroying these power sources reveals the way to the legendary blood of Lothander. Remember what I said about one-handing a weapon and shield? It's this one. This is the one-handed weapon. A slot for a crest guards the weapon, and a crest we have. Slotting it in disables the trap and gives us a very large power boost. But now, it's time to deal with the Inquisitor. Did someone say... minor illusion? I bet you haven't killed ward wargas like this before. Yes, I'm using barrels again. I tried using thunder wave, but they didn't get pushed back even when failing the save. But barrels? They have sure fire knockback. Looks like reinforcements are coming. I'll just be saving them for later. Yeah. Well, we've got one real boss left to deal with this run, and that's Auntie. So let me show you an easy way to kill the hag. Firstly, I shall demonstrate on this innocent looking sheep. By toggling non lethal attacks and giving them a whack, we can turn this innocent looking sheep into a red cap. You'll still get the XP and everything, and it won't even trigger any other enemies. Putting this same concept into practice, goodbye auntie. By the way, she was a literal hag. From this point you can kill her if you so choose and get all of her loot. Which, since she's a shopkeeper, it's a lot. We don't get any hair this way, but we really don't need it, considering our build so far. But with all of that done, Act 1 is complete. And it's time we packed off and headed to the cursed land we find ourselves in. For Act 2. Next time.